we are so thankful with this direction the Lord is leading us. We're actually going to be making um, some significant steps toward this direction that we're going to be announcing next Sunday. You're not going to want to miss it. We've got some really big announcements next Sunday. And um, so be sure that you're here. You're not going to want to miss a moment of it. Amen? Because it's not enough to just have a vision. We have to apply the vision. Because listen, where there is no vision, people perish. That word vision is kazone. You know, it's not calzone. It's, you know, it's, it's kazone. And the word kazone means a dream. It means to see a picture. It means an image or a reality seen with the heart. And, and, and that word perish there means they cast off restraint. They lose self-control. In that place, it says they have no focus. And I love this quote from a guy named P.K. Bernard. He said, a man without a vision is a man without a future, and a man without a future will always return to his past. How many know we're not called to go back? We're not called to look to Egypt when promise is right before us. And so I actually believe that God is, is giving some real clarity for each and every one of us so that we can have a clear and concise vision so we can be confident in the steps that each and every one of us take individually in the various areas and and expressions of that vision in our life as well as our collective vision as, uh, as Kingsway Church because there's many levels to the vision that God wants to give you. And, and while there's personal vision, there's also corporate vision. You have to have a vision for the peace and the grace and the gift and the life that God has given to you. But you also have to have a vision to say, okay, how does my peace connect with the puzzle? And vision is the connecting element of God that connects our peace with his puzzle and makes all of us come together as one. Amen? But let's do this. Let's pray. Father, We are so thankful. We're so thankful for your faithfulness in our life. We're so thankful for the clarity in your voice and the confidence, Lord, that you are placing in our heart. Lord, we just surrender our hearts to you during this time. God, I ask that you would speak by me and that your word would be on my tongue, Lord, that just like on the day of Pentecost, everyone was able to hear the gospel in their own language. Lord, that what you speak through one voice will be heard in many hearts to bring answers to many, many questions. Lord, that you would begin to illuminate uh, and, 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 and cause our hearts to come alive with the fullness of the hope of your calling for our life. In Jesus' name, God, I thank you, Lord, for the seeds of destiny and vision that you are planting within the hearts of our people. God, I thank you, Lord, that the soul soil has been made ready. Lord, the surroundings have been cultivated and that this is the season. And so God, I thank you, Lord, that this is not just a time to see and to hear, but it's also a time to become that which we behold. And as we begin to look clearly at the picture that you've placed before our lives of who you created us to be and what you've called us to do, Lord, that we would become the full expression lacking nothing. Lord, that we begin to remove in us the branches that are not currently producing, And Lord, that the branches that are producing in our life, Lord, that you would give us wisdom in how to prune and what to prune so that it could become more fruitful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus said in John 15, he said, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Fruit's good, much fruit's better, right? Fruit is good, much fruit is better. And so as we're looking at what vision uh, what, really, what really vision is, and today we're going to be talking at the 9 o'clock service about the value of vision. The 11 o'clock service, we're going to be talking about God vision. You see, there's a lot of people in, in, in secular society and in, in di- different areas of whether it's business or personal development, that, that vision is kind of like a 101 in terms of personal development. But how many of you know personal discovery is the first step to personal development? First, you have to find out what you're working with. Hallelujah. And then you have to have wisdom of how to apply what God has given. And see, we're not trying to come up with a vision for our life of what could be good or look good five years from now. The vision we're seeking is not just, hey, you know, what, what would I like to happen in my life? Because a lot of times when you ask certain people what the vision is for their life, it, it, it kind of revolves around them. Anybody ever seen that? And, and the truth is, we're not looking for a vision that revolves around us. We're looking for a vision that we can plug ourselves in that is not only worthy of our time, but it's also worthy of throwing our life at it to where you can become something of significance that the life that we live would live on long, be, long beyond our life. 
You know, there's, there's certain, we're going to be looking, we're going to be doing several studies throughout this summer on different uh, biblical heroes and figures, different uh, historical figures and heroes, and how a simple vision brought not only radical reformation, but also has produced lasting change. And see, that's really the fruit of vision in our life. But we're not looking just to say, you know, it'd be better if I had this or if I could pay my house off or if I could have a nicer car or a better job or, or you know, or shikiri baba, hallelujah. Some of you young guys and gals, are, you know, maybe thinking in terms of your vision for your spouse. Listen, never look through your eyes, always look through his eyes. We're going to be talking this morning about what it's like to look through his eyes. Because the vision we want is not the vision that seems right to a man that ends in destruction. The vision we want is what seems right in the heart of God. The vision we want is the thoughts that he thinks toward us that are of good and not of evil to give us a future filled with the friendly favor of God and a hope that is filled to overflow. But that can only come from his heart. That can only come from his voice. In Isaiah chapter 30, we see this amazing invitation in verse 15, he says that in returning and rest would be your confidence and in stillness and, and, and stillness, um, excuse me, in, in stillness and silence would be your strength. How many of you recognize that we're called to have confidence and we're called to have strength? Well, it's in returning and rest that you find confidence. It's in stillness and silence that you find strength. And there's a strength that can only come in silence. In fact, the Lord's really been speaking to me that oftentimes the highest level of direction and if need be correction in our life can only come through the sound of silence. And one of the things the Lord's really challenged me to do, um, even as God is just really flooding my heart with so many encouraging things for this house, is not just to say everything I'm hearing yet. Because there's a, there's a strength in walking before you talk. There's a lot of people who have let their vision out of the bag way too soon. Joseph is an excellent example. He had a vision from God, right? Gets a dream. God speaks to his heart. In immaturity, he runs and begins to tell his brothers. He's like, guess what? Y'all are going to worship me. I'm the man. I'm going to save everybody. (laughs) Hallelujah. Aren't you guys excited about that? No? Oh. God gave him vision, but he stewarded it with an immature heart. Okay? And so one of the things that we see is... Waiting time is not wasted time when it comes to vision because the thing about vision is not only does the vision have to mature in you, but you have to mature in the vision. Amen? And see, that's where the value you have for vision has to be greater than the urgency and the need of your day. And you allow the vision that God has given to you to define what your values are, begin to prioritize, not excuse me, your value actually defines your vision, but, but what vision does is it, prioritize your, it prioritizes your values. And so the values, we're going to talk about vision and values in the coming weeks. Values are the things that move your heart and then move your life. It is the near and dear to your heart. It is the things that matter most in you. For some, it's, for some it's, it's, it's something like family. For others, it could be a cause. Because so often you can see that, that, that vision really begins with a concern that leads to a cause. It's recognizing that there's a need in society. Something has to be done by someone somewhere. Nobody else is doing it. But because you see it, it could be that God has given you the authority and the resource and the grace to be able to bring the answer to what you see. That's what happened with Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah, when you look at, when you look at vision, Nehemiah is one of the greatest examples of vision in, in all of the Bible. And we're going we're gonna to be doing a study of Nehemiah this summer. And, and when you look at the life of Nehemiah, you know, he didn't have a real supernatural vision in terms of how it came. You know, you think about Joseph. Yes, it was a dream. You think about Moses. Man, the bush was on fire. You think about Noah. God spoke. He built an ark. Nehemiah just came back home and he saw a need that had not yet been met. And in that, it said that his heart was stirred. And his heart was stirred. He began to say, is there not a cause? And he began to recognize there was a great work that needed to be done, but somebody had to be the first to pick up the hammer. Somebody had to be the first to begin to open the door. Someone, there was favor to be had by someone, but God was looking for someone who would begin to step into that place of need and go to the king and say, listen, the wall lies in ruins and God has put something in my heart to do to bring not only restoration in our day, but also legacy for the days to come. And I believe, listen, for some of you, you're going to have a Nehemiah vision that captures your heart. 
that is going to be rebuilding, it's going to be redeeming, it's going to be restoring, it's going to be, you know, really uh, resurrecting, renewing, and reviving something that, that maybe has been established in times past and, and, and has suffered. It has suffered harm, it suffered heartache, it suffered uh, you know, destruction, and God is gonna give you a vision to come in and be, be the one who leads the charge to repair it. For others, God's gonna give you a vision about doing a completely new, brand, brand new thing, whether it's a new business, a new ministry, a new direction for your life. Others, God in your vision is gonna actually reveal to you that it's not a new thing you need to do, that you're exactly where you are, you're actually where you're supposed to be, doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, but the vision comes to begin to refine how you do it. And see, there's different facets and different expression of the vision. And so when we talk about vision, it's not about laying, just letting go of everything that's been, okay, to do what has not yet been seen. There's a part of that, but I want to tell you, there's also a balance of it. And so in the process of vision, I want to encourage you, one of the things that we're going to, we're going to do this summer, the reason why we're not rushing through this in three weeks is because we want to take our time. We want to take our time. Because we want to allow the vision that God gives each and every one of us to become mature in us and for us to become mature in the vision so we don't become like Joseph and run out and, 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 and wrongly steward what God is speaking and find ourselves in the pit and the place of false accusation and the prison before we ever get to the place of our call. God used all of those steps, but I believe that in hindsight, there's a couple things Joseph probably wished he would have done differently. Yes, what the enemy is meant for evil God did for good, but there were some things that Joseph did that actually empowered their evil against him. And how often in our life are there things that we do, mistakes that we make that actually empower the enemy's attack against us? It empowers his sifting in us. It says our adversary goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, not who he can. He doesn't have the ability unless we grant him permission. And what happens when we get into presumption, we begin to grant him permission because we begin to step out of grace, begin to step out of timing, we begin to step into our strength, our understanding, and pride. Pride and presumption will always open up the door to the enemy. Amen? So again, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Again, vision is a sight. It's a dream. It's a revelation. The word perish means to cast off restraint. It's the place of no self-control. It's the life without boundaries. It's the life without direction. One of the things that vision will do for your life is it, it will give clear direction. Amen. Perish also means no focus or living to please today. When it says perish, it means that you're putting out all kinds of energy but you're never really accomplishing anything of, of significance. You're just simply maintaining where you are and, and just staying afloat. But how many of you know we're not called to tread water all of our days? We're called to walk on water. Amen. And when we get a God vision and God begins to speak to us to come out of the boat of convenience and complacency and begin to take steps of faith. Remember, John Wimber spelled faith R-I-S-K. Oftentimes, there's a risk element connected to your vision. And so oftentimes, you have to step out not knowing what it's going to look like. We talked last week about four stages of, of, of vision. And, and the four stages of vision was first, you have the Spirit's prompting. You see this in Acts chapter 20. The Holy Spirit begins to prompt Paul about a missionary journey he's supposed to go to. And then he goes on and says, you know, but I'm not really sure what it's going to look like. In fact, turn there with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Hallelujah. Here it is. Acts 20, 20, verse 22. Okay? And see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. That word bound means compelled by or tied to. Okay? He, he wasn't hogtied and sent to Jerusalem. He was bound by the spirit. He was compelled by the spirit. He was tied he was connected to the life of the Spirit. So that begins the Spirit's prompting. But then look, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. So it was the Spirit who led him, but the Spirit didn't give, all the, give all the details about what was gonna happen where he went, except there would be suffering, there would be predictable resistance. Because oftentimes what happens is God will begin to illuminate something in our heart. He'll prompt us by his spirit. We'll begin to say, yes, this is God. And as soon as we begin to take that first step, all of a sudden, the only thing we can become certain of is certain uncertainty. You ever had certain uncertainty? 
You don't know what you know, but one thing you know is you don't know. That is certain uncertainty. I know what, but I'm uncertain as to how. See, because oftentimes people miss out on ever accomplishing the what because they get preoccupied with the how, but you cannot steer a parked car. Until you start beginning to move toward the what, the how will not become clear. He doesn't need to tell you to take left. He doesn't need to tell you to take a left at the end of the street when you're at the beginning of the street. And see, one of the things about vision is it is first a lamp into our feet and then a light into our path. Okay, there is an element of beginning to see forward into the future of God, because one of the things that vision does, it'll step into your future and begin to speak back to your present. Vision allows you to step into what your life is meant to look like according to God's standards and God's vision five years from now. And then it shouts back to you, hey, Michael, this is what you look like five years from now. Hey, Michael, this is what Patria looks like five years from now. And then all of a sudden, because he has the vision of what's supposed to happen five years from now, he can begin to start being intentional and practical in the steps that he takes now to help him to accomplish that vision. That he's not waiting for four years and six months from now to get started but he's living today for tomorrow. And that's what vision does. Vision prioritizes your values and values. And in that, you begin to see that what used to be mundane now matters. There's beauty in, in the smallest of tasks. There's adventure, there's joy. When you begin, one of the things that vision will begin to unlock in your heart is passion that leads to motivation. And then that motivation becomes direction that produces momentum. And then that momentum finally accomplishes purpose. But let's look at Paul again. So he says, see now I go bound, compelled, tied to the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. In other words, the only thing I'm certain of, whew, it's gonna be hard. I'm gonna suffer. And he was the apostle of grace. That'll tweak a couple of grace preachers out there. I'm just gonna leave that there. Shiki Baba. So, because honestly, how you suffer says a whole lot about what you believe about your Savior. We, we, we modeled this. I think it was Wednesday night. You know, empty water bottles always make the most noise. When you drink it and you start crinkling it, guess what? That thing is loud and it's obnoxious and it bothers everybody around it. But something that's full, you know, with this one I've drank a little bit, hallelujah. So it's got a little noise to it. But if you were to take a full one, the one that hadn't been cracked open, guess what? It can come under the same pressure, but what's on the inside is greater than what's on the outside. And because of that, it can remain silent in the process. Oftentimes, the people that make the most noise are the most empty inside. And we know it bothers everybody around them. <laughs> it's in that place you need to let the next voice you hear be the voice of silence. In fact, I'm doing something next Sunday that I've not done since we've come here. And um, I really feel the purpose of the Lord on it. And uh, the Lord started speaking to me about the importance of getting away and just being silent and just listening. To not try to, to, not try to hear a present vision in the midst of my current busyness. Because how many of you know the busyness of life will always cause your vision to become blurry? It's really hard to hear in the white noise of what is. And so to, next week after service, we'll, we'll end service here. I'll go to lunch with my family, and then I'm going out of town. And I'm going to an isolated place. Tina's going to join me about middle of the week, and I'll get to tell her all the things that, we sh that the Lord's been sharing with me. And then we'll come back for the Paul Keith conference. But I'm getting away just to listen, just to hear. Because I can tell you this, there's such a grace on hearing right now. Yes. Such a grace. Listen, you can't hear if you don't listen. You can't see if you don't look. And oftentimes we're preoccupied by the things that are trying to be seen and the things that are trying to be heard instead of going back to the still small whisper. And so one of my things is just, I want to go quiet in my heart. The Lord's been speaking to me about Evan Roberts and at the height of the Welsh revival when, when most people would have been like promoting the world tour and taking the conference on the road and doing all these kind of things. He disappeared for what he called a week of silence. At the highest moment when things were, were, were blowing, going and growing, hallelujah. He escaped. And he said, Lord, I, I, just, I just want to make sure that I'm hearing you. And there's a beauty, there's a value in times of silence. And every time I think about it, I just, I feel the presence of God. And I know that there's something that he's going to do in me and for us in that time. And I encourage each of you to find 
that place of silence and solitude. You may not be able to get away for a week like me. You know, it's the first time I've, got, I've done that since we've moved here. <laughs> Tina said ever. <laughs> Tina said ever. But it's just one of those things like, it was like the Lord saying, will you take this step of faith? Because honestly, oftentimes in times past, I felt like I couldn't step away because if I stepped away, who would do all the work? And now I've just said, listen, I've got to step away so that we can make sure we're doing the right things. We're not just doing something because I think oftentimes going from one thing to the next thing can, can keep you from the best thing. And what I'm all about, we're going to talk about it next week. We're going to talk about really the, the prioritize, the prior to, how, I'm about to make up a word, so I got to make sure I pronounce it right. I'll just do a word that we've got. Prioritizing your pruning. The Lord told me, and this is next week's message, but hallelujah. The Lord told me that if we would choose the discipline of pruning in the summer, that we would not experience the pruning of the fall. As a church, a lot of times, you know, you know, it's weird between like the Hebraic New Year and the Gregorian New Year. If anybody has a devil, they manifest it. Hallelujah. If people are going to go weird, they're going to go weird then. If people are going to go off the reservation, they're going to go off it then. And, and it, it always, you know, it's, it, you know, and typically, of course, there's, you know, a weakness in the soul. You know, there's, you know, bless God, Jezebel and Absalom, they come out to party around that time. Leviathan, Python, all the thongs, the, not the thongs. You've, I'm speaking to a visual church here. <laughs> but the Lord told me that if, if we would choose, if we would make the choice to choose pruning in the summer, that we would experience the, the, the personal growth, the spiritual advancement, the acceleration that so many of us experience in the new year in January, that we would actually experience it in the fall in a much greater fullness than we've ever known. And so one of the things is as your pastors, as your leaders, we're never gonna ask you to go somewhere that we're not willing to lead you. We're never gonna tell you that you need to do less if we're not willing to do less. We're not gonna tell you that you need to learn to say no if we're not willing to say no. And we're gonna talk next week about some of what that looks like. Because one of the things the Lord is speaking to me about this summer is that this is a time to begin to narrow our focus to narrow our focus and, and focus on the, the highest and best use of each of our times. Because how many of you know, listen, the one of the things the Lord's been speaking to me is doing less better. Doing less better. How many of you, that, that just gives relief to your heart. This is an Italian proverb that I found this week. It says, he who does too much often does too little. That'll make you want a cannoli. How many of us are doing too much and because of that are doing too little or it's, it's just we're giving, giving, giving and at the end we say, wait a minute, am I doing this out of revelation or obligation? Was it something that God said back then that I needed to do this and I've continued to do it and it's become tradition? And I continued and, it, and to where it started with revelation but it's become tradition and because it's tradition, it's obligation. And we really wanna say, okay, God, what, what are we supposed to be doing as a church? What are, the, what are the areas in this church and in, this, in, in, in us personally that are branches that are not producing fruit? That we just need to, they were fruitful, but bless God, they've already bloomed. Tim, Tim Relaford and I were talking about pruning the other day, and he was talking about, you know, that, that once, once the bloom has happened, you got to cut off the old bloom. Otherwise, the root can't do the right work because it's feeding a dead thing. So how many dead things are we feeding in our life by just simply holding on to the past picture of beauty? It was beautiful once, and so we're holding on to it. And the truth is, it's costing us life in the process. Listen, I want to cut my life down to the nub. Anything in me, I'm like, Lord, listen, if it was good for then and it's not God for now, I want to be the first to cut it. And I think that what God is doing right now is he's allowing us to sharpen the cutting instruments of our life so that when we recognize, when he shows you and says, this is a branch, that we don't have to like just try to go at that thing with some sort of dull blade or just hacking at it with a dull ax, but we can just with the scalpel, of, the scalpel, like a strategic scalpel and a strategic cut, we could begin to remove what is not fruitful and then recognize the things that are fruitful, begin to prune them, because how many know they need to be cut too? In fact, this Wednesday in the process of promise, we're gonna be talking about the next phase of promise, and guess what it is? Pruning. <laughs> Hallelujah, we're getting out the shears. We're going after it, we're cutting things. Because pruning is the reward of God for all growth in your life. 
Whatever grows needs to be pruned so it can become more fruitful. Otherwise, it'll become overgrown, and in that, it'll overwhelm. And so vision is what allows us to have perspective and eyes to see what needs to be trimmed in our life. Let's go back to to Paul in Acts 20. So he said, and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, compelled, tied to, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. So he went from the prompting of the Holy Spirit to certain uncertainty, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that the chains and tribulations await me, okay? Predictable resistance. Once you get a vision, once all of a sudden God gives clarity to your heart about the direction you're supposed to move into, not only will there be that certain uncertainty, but also I wanna tell you there'll be resistance, but it's predictable, We talked about some examples last week. All of a sudden you decide to start praying with your spouse and you lose your voice. All of a sudden you start trying to be a better steward of your finances and giving God, you know, know, honoring God with the first of your income. And then all of a sudden you begin to write that, 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 that tie check or that offering check. And then the dishwasher breaks and a new one is almost as much as your offering and your tithe and what you had put God's name on. And then how quickly do people take God's name off and put whirlpools on? You decide to, you get, a, you get a vision, you get a revelation for your body and for health, and then all of a sudden you decide to, to go on a diet and Twinkies go on sale. You know? All of a sudden they build a Krispy Kreme at the front, like, of your neighborhood, and, like, the hot and now sign is on a year before they ever come. Listen, they're, I know the principality that's set against me, they're building an Edgar's on 11. Yeah. Marsh is rejoicing at I am too. I love Edgar's. But here's the thing is, I have a vision for my health now so I won't perish. And see, in whatever area of your life you don't have vision, you will perish. If you don't have vision for your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit, that this is not yours, but it's something that he gave to you that will come back to him. How many of you know, listen, if it's going back to God, you're gonna take a little bit better care of it. Don't just think of it as going in the dirt and decaying, but honestly, how we live our life actually echoes in the halls of heaven. If you don't have a vision for your finances, you'll begin to overspend. You'll find yourself in debt. If you don't have a vision for your, for your marriage and for godly family, you'll be part of that 50% that end up in divorce. If you don't have, I'm telling you, all of these different areas, in whatever area you have cast off restraint, in whatever area you lack self-control, the truth is it's in that place you have not yet got a vision. You don't have a revelation. And without a revelation, without a vision, people perish. They cast off restraint. The Passion Translation says they wander astray. In Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there is no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. And I just wanna tell you, listen, my soul has never been so full of heaven's bliss as it is right now. Listen, I've never been. I, I, I was thinking about it the other day. I don't remember a time in my life and in a time in ministry when I have felt less pressure than I feel right now. But at the same time, I've got more vision, I've got more strength, I've got more anointing, I have less care and I have less concerns. You know why? Because I've got less worries. Because instead of just trying to see how I'm going to fix what's broke, I begin to say, Lord, is it supposed to be fixed? Or bless God, we need to cut the broken branch and do a new thing. And I wanna tell you, listen, Oftentimes I sense and I feel things just before. It's kind of like the preface of what's about to happen for us because we're one body. And whatever, part, whatever member of the body I am, I kind of feel and sense and discern what God is bringing to this house. And so I can tell you what is getting ready to come to your heart, what is getting ready to come to your house, if you'll begin to allow the Lord to bring some pruning in your heart, bring some pruning in your life, and begin to bring some... Um, um, some necessary direction and correction when need be. Amen? Because it goes on, and not only did Paul have the Spirit's prompting and certain uncertainty and predictable resistance, he had that that enemy, that opposing force, that obstacle, he had uncommon clarity. Because what God wants to give you in the place of correction, in the place of vision, is, is, is uncommon clarity that you could see clearly. Look in verse 24. So he's talking about the chains and tribulations. He says, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. He said, listen, all that that happens 
People are resisting, they're opposing, they're talking about me on the Facebook, hallelujah. But guess what? It doesn't bother me because my heart is fixed. The vision before me is greater than the battle around me. And I'm so, I'm so set, my heart is so set on where I'm going and what I'm called to do. And so he goes clearly into verse 24 and tells us where he's going and what he's supposed to do. He says, none of these things move me because see the thing about vision is it's gonna give you confidence, it's gonna give you focus, it's gonna give you resolve. In fact, a clear vision will make most decisions for you. You won't have to weigh out, should I or, sh- or shouldn't I? You'll begin to say, wait a minute, does this line up with the vision of who God has called me to be and what I'm called to do? Because if not, I'm sorry, that's a great opportunity. It's an awesome thing. Not something God's called me to, but good luck with that. Can you say that in church? You're supposed to. Because what happens is oftentimes the body becomes disabled because you've got a small group of people doing everything that needs to be done. And then that, they're actually doing things that deplete them in life and ministry. And the things that are depleting them actually would bring life to others. Why? Because there were other members that were created to fulfill that purpose. Vision's always gonna point to your purpose. How many of you want vision? Come on, that cause I'm None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, and here's his vision, here's his mission, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, he said, this is, this is, what, I'm called, this is what I'm called for. This is who I am. This is what I'm called to do. Stuff's going to happen, but I'm not going to allow what happens to me to happen in me. I'm not going to allow it to move me. One of the things that vision does is vision will always pursue depth before it pursues height and width. Vision will always, you know, a, a God-given vision. Now listen, there a carnal vision, you're gonna go for the height and the width. You're gonna try to go up and grow out. God-given vision will always bring you in. It'll always do a work in before it'll do a work through. See, because God has prepared a great and mighty work not only for you to do, but also a great and mighty work that he wants to do through you, just like Nehemiah. But he can't do a great and mighty work through you until you allow him to do a great and mighty work in you. And that's the beauty of being willing to wait in the midst of vision, to walk it before you talk it, to investigate before you initiate. Oh, hallelujah. I feel some rhyming coming on. So for those of you who were not here last week, let's define vision. Vision is a clear mental picture of what could be fueled by the conviction that it should be partnered with the proper planning and execution so that what could be, would be. How many of you know it won't be if you don't take the steps to follow through? If, there's, if, if you don't write the vision, there's nobody to, re- if you, no one can read your vision and run with your vision if you don't first write it, amen? So an example, an example of vision would be Simon Peter. We're gonna get more into this in the coming weeks, but I saw this yesterday and I was like, wow, God, that is amazing. In, in Matthew 16, when, when Simon Peter, when Peter gets the keys of the kingdom, right? That's amazing. When he gets these keys and he has this revelation, it all started with a vision. He said, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? Because see, the first revelation we have to have is who he is. And he said, you're the, you're the Christ, the son of living God. And Jesus said, listen, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Now, Simon, the name Simon means uh, he has heard. Simon. It actually comes from a Hebrew name, Shimon. I think that was a lyric from Michael Jackson's song, Bad, wasn't it? Shimon, 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 Shimon. And then you think the Weird Al version, like ham and whole wheat? Oh, yeah. Anyway, 80s kid. So Simon, listen, Simon was not yet Peter when he had the vision, but the vision pointed to who he was called to be. And so Jesus said, this has been revealed to you. You've had a vision You've had something made known to you, a clear mental picture of who I am based on what he says. That's what we all need, right? And then he says, and you are Peter. Well, Peter means stone. And then he gives the vision and mission of Peter's life right there. And if you don't, if you don't read it, if you don't really hunker down on it, you'll just skim past it. He said, and upon this rock, I will build my church. So he gave him his vision to build the church. Gave him his mission. And the keys that I give you, you'll begin to use to begin to bind on earth what has been bound in heaven, to loose on earth what has been loosed in heaven. So the mission was to bring heaven on earth. The vision to accomplish the mission was to build the church. Why? Because he went from having heard to becoming a rock that could be stable and secure and strong. Amen? Amen? Simon became Peter. Who does God want us to become in the process of our vision? What does God want your life to look like five years from now, your marriage, your business, this church? 
your finances, your health. The picture you see in each of those areas is the image you empower and the vision you are partnering with. We talked briefly last week about the vision hub, and I'm going to talk more about that in the coming weeks because of the multifaceted aspects that vision is supposed to touch every area of your life. Every area of your life, every area you've been called as a steward, you have to have a vision. Vision is the antidote to the lukewarm church because vision gives passion. Vision will take someone who is lukewarm and apathetic. If they get a vision, all of a sudden their heart will get really hot really quick. But again, you have to temper the voice of vision because when you get a vision, you don't want to come in hot. Because when people come in hot with the vision, they begin to push people away that are meant to be pulled in. But vision will take the lukewarm and cause them to become hot with passion. Vision not only fans flame, but vision begins to cause a greater oil to fuel the flame in the first place. Four attributes, of course, that vision imparts, passion, motivation, direction, or a roadmap. Vision helps, to see, helps you to see where you're going and gives you how to get there. Again, we talked last week when you go to the mall, very, the two most important things are where you're going and the little dot that says you are here. And how many of you know, I don't know about you, but listen, I've been in some situations before, like, you know, I remember there's a couple weddings I've done. And for some reason, all y'all like to get married in these backwoods places that have no cell phone signal and you just need to stop it. I know it's pretty, but a guy like me, I don't print off directions. I don't do that whole map quest printed off like, you know, <laughs> hallelujah. Nana, you're amazing with your directions. She does. Nan has got, a, she's got a, a three ring binder of directions of everywhere she's ever been, just in case she might want to go back there. But for me, I'm a GPS guy, right? My phone. And so for me, like all of a sudden when I don't have cell phone signal, I'm stuck. And so I'm like, just like asking the Lord, okay, well, where do I go from here? How many of you have ever been on the way to a wedding and you've gotten lost along the way? Come on now. Aren't we all coming to the wedding banquet of the lamb? We've, we've been called to a place for a certain event and a certain cause at a certain time, and we lost our way along the way because we did not have the direction we needed to get to where God wanted us to go. Vision makes clear those directions for your life. In fact, vision is God's recipe for your life. It's his recipe. You cooks and chefs and bakers out there, how many of you ever try to make something from memory and you're a little fuzzy on it? Maybe you had heard it from somebody else, but you hadn't done it before and you didn't have the, the written ingredients and directions and steps and you find yourself substituting something that looks like what you need. And before you know it, you've got two cups of salt and not two cups of sugar and your cake has been ruined. This is why we've got to write the vision. This is why we've got to make it plain on tablets. The thing about vision, the more you write, the more clear it becomes in the process. Because too often people are substituting a God thing, a God ingredient for a good ingredient. Well, this will do. Well, I had this in the pantry, so I'll just use this in its place. How many things have we used in the place of what God asked? And because of that, it's cost us what God wanted to create in and through our life. Habakkuk chapter two, let's jump there real quick. I will stand my watch. That speaks of personal responsibility. Nobody can get your vision for you but you. Listen, I can't give you a prophetic word that is going to give you your vision. Prayerfully, myself and others in this church will hear from God for you and what we communicate to you will bring confirmation to what God has said. But see, you have to get your vision. It is from God's heart to your life. I will stand my watch. So first you have to take responsibility to seek God for vision. Secondly, secondly, I will set myself on the rampart. And so oftentimes it's a decision to set yourself aside, to pull back for a brief season in silence and solitude and just seek the Lord. For some of you, it may just be as small as just going, like taking your quiet time in the backyard, just so you're not tempted to turn on the TV and leave your phone inside. Well, that's where my Bible app is. Well, here, there's bookstores everywhere. <laughs> you know, um, I love the access of having resources on our phone, but the problem is, is when you begin to access the resources on your phone, distraction is only a button away. And the thing about, listen, the thing about vision is it's meant to give you focus. And as your focus increases, your options will decrease. Doing less, better. How many of you, how many of you want a quality life? The things that you do, you want them to matter. 
How many of you are willing to say no in some areas of quantity so you can say yes in some areas of quality? This is an area, listen, the Lord, I'm telling you, I, I am like, everything in my life is on the table. And I'm just like, I've, it's been so freeing and so liberating as I'm going through things with the Lord and going, man, I don't need that, God. That's not helping me move forward to where I'm called to be. You know, whether it's old clothes from my fat days or whether it's something that I used to do, you know, I'm getting ready to sell my motorcycle. Why? I just don't feel like it's the best use of my time right now. I feel like I could, I could reallocate those resources to another area that would help my vision move forward. And so, you know, we love basketball. We love basketball and I love competition. That's a surprise to most of you, I know. And so we typically play basketball year round, but we got together this year and typically summer, summer league is a big thing for us. And uh, all three boys, and I coach them all and do all that kind of stuff. And we just said, you know what? Family is a greater value for us. And so we're going to make some hard decisions this summer and say, we're, we're not going to busy ourselves with basketball, but we're going to make time for what matters most basketball will be there. We'll do things along the way. We, we didn't not do it. We just changed the posture of how we did it. And we're actually becoming more intentional and growing in the process. And instead of being filled with much, we're focusing on what matters most. Amen. And so, you know, speaking of that, let me give you a quote from Steve Jobs here. You know, tomorrow is the WWDC. It's when Apple announces all of their new software and prayerfully some new hardware. You know, oftentimes, you know, Apple really is, the, there's a, a, prophetic, um, a prophetic element to what they're seeing and what they're saying so often. But Steve Jobs, this is what he said. He said, if you're working on something exciting that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. If you are working on something exciting that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. Now, this is Steve Jobs on innovation and the power of no, which we talked about a lot. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go back and watch, you know, our very first, um, very first messages in this series, vision, seeing clearly in an unclear world, world. The 11 o'clock, we talk about what is vision. And we talked a good bit about the power of no, because honestly, if you're not willing to say no to a few things, you really can't be true to yes in anything. He said, people think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. Rather, getting breakthrough focus, not just focus, but breakthrough focus. You know what breakthrough focus does? It gives you momentum to move forward in a way that is beyond your grace and strength. It allows you to step into that place where all of a sudden the vision carries you. All of a sudden, the call of God begins to pull you into a place that it's no longer what you're doing by your energy and your efforts, but all of a sudden, God begins to make things happen for you that only he can make happen. That's breakthrough focus. People think focus means saying yes to the things you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. Rather, getting breakthrough focus means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that there are. You have to pick carefully, Job's, caution, Job's cautioned. <laughs> Job. In fact, he said that he was actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things I have done. Isn't that amazing? He was as proud of what they had not done as an organization as what they had done. Because how many of you know, once the promise begins to produce, everybody else is gonna come to you with good ideas and great opportunities, but rarely what they bring is God's plan for your life. That's why when your promise begins to produce, it's actually one of the most dangerous times in the process of your promise because it's in that place that many people, it says in Proverbs 21, 20, there is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. Oftentimes, if you have a need in you, when people begin to come to you with their need, you'll allow your treasure and your oil to be squandered when you begin to produce prematurely. And the thing about vision is it knows that we are playing a long game in life. Vision always sees where we are and where we're going, and it makes decisions with that in mind. So you have to pick carefully, Jobs cautioned. In fact, he said that he was actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things I have done. Innovation means saying no to a thousand things. So what are we going to say no to this week so we can recover the power and the precision of our yes? Every yes is an obligation, and too many obligations become an, an obstacle. What have we said yes to in our personal lives that has created burden, that is keeping us in a, in a place of blurred vision to where we cannot see clearly what God wants to say? Let's finish up with Habakkuk 2. 
this is so awesome. The, the, the scripture I plan on talking, we're gonna have to do that at the 11 o'clock. This one I've been excited about for three weeks. It just kind of keeps going and honestly keeps kind of marinating. But, but I'm telling you, this is a journey. This is not a sprint. Vision is not accomplished overnight. Vision is something that is partnered with for an extended amount of time. In fact, if you look at the life of most visions, to see a vision come to pass, it typically has about a five-year life. And then at the end of the five years, it's not a brand new or a different vision, but often it has to be a refined vision. And when we came to this city, God gave us a five-year vision about these escrow accounts and what had happened between in the 80s, 1983 to 1988, that there was these escrow accounts. You guys have all heard me share this. I had an encounter where I was taken up in heaven and I saw these escrow accounts that had been set over Birmingham in the Jefferson County area. And they had been established in the years 1983 to 1988 and prophetic promises were given that were partnered with for a season, but delay came as a result of division and discouragement but that if we would go back and if we would begin to rebuild and honor those who had gone before us, that those escrow accounts be re-released with interest, causing keys to be given, doors to be opened. I didn't know this was gonna be the year of the open door. From 2013 to 2018, he said, listen, if you'll do this, doors will be open. Oh, and by the way, then the promise will be occupied. And we've been faithful to walk that vision. We've been faithful, even though it's been hard, even though there's been predictable resistance, we've been faithful to walk through certain uncertainty based on the Spirit's prompting to come into a place of uncommon clarity. And I tell you now that we stand on the verge of promise being occupied and it's vision that will cause us to enter in. So Habakkuk 2, he says, I will stand my watch. I will take responsibility for my life and I will set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. See, silence, being willing to be silent, actually, not only will it bring the highest level of direction, but also the correction we need most. He said, how I'm gonna respond. In other words, what's gonna happen in me when he begins to go to work for me? Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, make it clear that he may run who reads it for the vision is yet for an appointed time. It's a fixed time, it's a season. It's previously designated as a window of grace in your life and in the life of the vision. The vision is yet for an appointed time. In other words, it's, it's pointing to what's coming, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So what is that? That sounds kind of, kind of conflicting. It'll tarry, hang on. It won't tarry. Why? Because the vision goes to work right when it comes. But the manifestation of the vision is where you have to be patient in the process and say, I don't want it for me until it happens in me. Amen? Pastor Jeff? As Pastor Jeff and the worship team are coming, we prepare to receive our offering today. Verse four here says, behold the proud, the presumptuous. It says his soul is not upright in him. Why? Why is his soul not upright? Because it's weighed down with worry. The just shall live by his faith. We've talked over the past couple of weeks about faith, walking by faith and not by sight, walking by what he says and not by what we see in the natural. And if you were to look back at everything that God has been speaking to us over, this, over the, the recent weeks and months, we would see that God is so clearly leading us to this place, this place that he's bringing us into a place of defining our vision and refining our life. How many of you are ready to lighten your load so you can increase your capacity? Oh man, I'm telling you. Guys, I see the freedom that is available for each and every one of us. How many of you have been feeling that sense of freedom? You're almost kind of like, whew, hallelujah. Out with the bad air and in with the God air. Amen? Everyone ends up somewhere in life, but only those with a vision end up somewhere on purpose. And we are a people of purpose. And where we're going, God has a purpose and a plan to get us there. Vision gives clarity in your yes and confidence in your no. Vision will prioritize your value and it helps you to live dependent on purpose and not people. A lack of vision always sees people and things as a means to an end, but vision sees beyond the person, sees beyond the thing and sees the purpose for which they were created. And vision gives you the skill and the tool to help them accomplish what they're called to do and become who they're called to be. Because one of the things about true God-given vision is it is not self-seeking. True God-given vision seeks first the kingdom and his righteousness, recognizing that everything we have need of in life, I mean, listen, we live in a natural world, it's a physical place, 
We get hungry, we need a cheeseburger. No bun, please. Bless God. You gotta have clothes, you gotta place to live. God knows the things you have need of. And the thing about vision, oftentimes vision comes with a cost. Oftentimes vision comes with a cost. You know, a vision for health, it's not, it's not really a new cost, it's actually a reallocated expense. Because like sometimes if you get a vision for health, all of a sudden that's gonna, that may cost you some new clothes, it may cost you a gym membership, it may cost you some healthier foods, it may look like more money now, but guess what? It's gonna save you more money later because you either spend it now getting healthy or you spend it later getting cared for by a doctor. And so vision will actually reallocate your time It'll reallocate your resource. It'll reallocate your relation. It'll restructure your relationships and it'll reprioritize your life. Amen? It'll help us become all that we're called to be. And in this time right now, even as we begin to minister to the Lord in our offering, I'm thankful. I want to tell you how proud I am of each and every one of you that this is a house that knows what it's like to say no to us so we can say yes to him time and time again, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Amen? And so I'm gonna invite you just to stand to your feet. This is a message that I'm, I'm really embodying. It's, 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 it's going to work in me before it goes to work through me. You know, even right now, I'm thinking of all the things that I want to say and da 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 da, da and I'm saying no so I can say yes, hallelujah. We're all growing, amen? but it's giving yourself grace to grow. If you are with us at the 11 o'clock service, we're gonna move on from this and talk about a God vision, God willing, and uh, prayerfully get to share some of what the Lord's been speaking over these past few weeks. But I wanna tell you how excited I am for you. I wanna tell you how much I love you and how much I believe in you and how much I believe in the vision that God has for your life. You're not here by accident. You're here by divine appointment for a divine assignment. God has aligned your life in a way, not only to prosper, but also to accomplish purpose. And when we begin to start saying no to the less than, we can say yes to the more than. When we begin to start saying no to the good and what's gonna advance our cause, we can begin to start saying yes to the God and what's gonna advance his kingdom. And I don't know about you, but listen, if, if, if we're king's way in any way, let it be his way. Let it, let it never be on the door and not in our hearts. Lord, let it never be just, just an, a term to describe us and not the vision for this body. Amen? So go ahead and take your offering in your hand. Father, as we seek first your kingdom today in our heart and our finances, we seek to honor you, to trust you, to give back to you of what you've so abundantly blessed us with. God, I ask that you'd give each and every one of us the opportunity to step out of ourselves, to step out of the things that we've made into the thing that you've made for us. In the same way that Abraham had to step out of his tent to step into your stars, Father, right now, give us the practical steps to begin to transition in faith without fear into a place of new vision, into a place of great grace, and into a place of forward, forward momentum. In Jesus' name, Amen. Come on down, let's minister to the Lord in our giving. As we continue just in this, this spirit of giving, I know people are preparing to pick up their kids from King's Kids, but Robert just came up and said something that is awesome. And I wanted him to share it with you because I believe that he'll, it'll encourage your heart 
How, again, I'm telling you, listen, my heart is so hopeful. I don't know about you, but I, I believe that what God is giving is contagious. Not only is it gonna affect our church, but I believe it's gonna affect our city. I believe that God is gonna make us carriers of vision that becomes viral. Wouldn't that be awesome that all of a sudden we have a vision that becomes viral. But go ahead and tell, me, tell them what you just told me. I was telling Pastor Jason that last week I was doing some research about the 2020 vision and the 2018 vision. And to come to find out that 2018 vision is actually better than 2020 vision. That what 2018 vision is that any person that sees at 20 feet, that person that can actually see at 18 feet. So they can see it at a better distance. They can see it at a clearer vision, 18 feet away. So that, did y'all hear that? So he was saying that he was researching vision and tw just the year 2018 and a, and a study came up on 2018 vision as opposed to 2020. And it was actually, there was, there was a strength to a 2018 vision to where you could begin to see more clearly things that are farther away than 2020 vision. Isn't that awesome? And so God, I thank you, Lord, that you're giving us clarity in the now for the next you have appointed and anointed for our life. In Jesus' name, we bless you. We love you. Listen, I wanna tell you this. If you're here today and you need ministry, I know we've got ministry teams at our 11 o'clock service. But also I know we're, with this new service structure, we've got some time to be able to minister to those areas. And so if you're here today and you need healing or you need ministry or you need a prophetic word, something like that, if you could just come on over here to my right and I'm gonna ask other folks. And if, does anybody here need healing or need ministry in those areas? If so, come on down. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna ask those of you who are not in need of healing, <laughs> Those of you who are not in need, you guys are the ministry team. So if you guys could come on down and just connect with these folks, love on them, pray for them, speak the word over them. If you have kids and King's kids, we ask that you go and you release the workers, bless them, and we'll see you again at 11 o'clock. We've got four folks up here, five folks in need of ministry. Amen. Hey, Maxine, why don't you come on down and minister to Candy? Hope, Hope Kelly, come on down and minister to Jeannie Kuhlman.